Well, in a world where change is the only certainty, perhaps followed uh, by the other near certainty, which is that it will be increasingly rapid and leave us breathless yes. in its wake, it strikes me that there's one interesting area in the great moral canvas of issues that we, uh, cons we've considered as, as human beings over recent decades, where there's a, something of a rethink going on, and it's on the vexed issue of abortion in America. Uh, and I'm just interested in your views. You're now seeing um, some quite remarkable events. Uh, the pro-life movement in America seems to be greatly reinvigorated. Uh, you've got many states starting to change the law to make abortions um, uh, illegal once a heartbeat can be detected, whereas in Australia uh, and indeed in New York not so long ago, you've had great celebrations of the idea that a baby can be aborted right up until the time that it can be born. Uh, yeah. Um, what is it about America? Because it's not happening in our culture. I don't think it's happening in Britain. I'm not sure about Europe. Mm -hmm. But in America, it seems as though it's one social indicator where there's something of a rethink and a retake going on more than um, might be expected. And of course, it will be very, very divisive as an issue. I'd just be interested in your perspectives. Occasionally, we do a rethink. I mean, for many years, slavery was thought of as part of the natural order of things, including by all of the early major Enlightenment figures. Uh, that's often forgotten. Uh, we would now say, no, we were completely wrong there, and we reversed tack. What's happening in your view in America that is leading to this rethink? And I don't think that's too strong a word on the part yeah. of a lot of Americans. Well, I think there's, there's two things that are going on. And then there's this further question, why are they going on there and not elsewhere? Um, so, you, you know, you, it's a very good question, but it, 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 you know, it, it's going to take me a couple of minutes to try and separate out the factors and so on. Let me just say something about America generally, and, and then I'll come to the particularities of the abortion issue. America is a very idealistic society. It's a very young society, uh, relatively speaking, and it's founded, not exactly uniquely, but, but very, uh, on something very rare, which are philosophical principles. The American Constitution is a work of political philosophy, or political legal philosophy, you might say, and it's very idealistic. So it, people sat down and they asked themselves a question, a question that Plato asked himself in the Republic two and a half thousand years ago, and he wrote that, and uh, when he wrote the laws, and then Aristotle takes that on in his politics and so on, and Cicero in the Roman world and so on and such like. But here's I mean, the question is, what is justice? What are the basic principles of justice? How ought a society be constituted? What's the relationship between the individual and the state and so on? These ethical political questions, in the case of the United States, were not only asked, but having been asked, they were answered and a constitution was devised and a society was established. So the United States of America is, in its way, the most philosophical constitution that we have. It's one that's been deliberated, thought through, and so on. And this is an aspect of American consciousness, which is a kind of idealism. Americans really believe that things can be done well and should be done well, that they don't, as it were, just settle with what there is. They, they, they want to try to make sure that it's good. And among the things that American val Americans value are things like family. It's part of the American ideal family. So the having of children, the forming of families and so on, is very much part of the American conception of the good life. So Americans are just in general, notwithstanding the changes radicals have tried to introduce and so on, but Americans are just much more attached to family life. Uh, than, uh, say, our Europeans, for example, or indeed, I think, Australians. I mean, it's an irony, because we think of Europeans, particularly, say, of the Mediterranean or Southern Europe and so on, as you know, these large families and so on. But as you probably know, countries like Spain and Portugal and Italy and such, like Greece, are, are below replacement level. Uh, I mean, it takes 2.1 births, live births, to, to maintain a population. Some of these countries are you know, dropping towards one, and if not, then going to move below that. So they are um, the, the, the places that were once celebratory of family, you might say we very much associated them with family, are ceasing to have children. I think 
this statistic, I don't know if it's exactly right the year that I'm going to get it, but I think by 2050, or it might be 2060, I, can't, I think it's 2050, I think that something like 60% of Italians will have no brother, sister, first cousin, aunt or uncle. Uh, two yeah. generations of single children. Now, Americans, on the other hand, um, have embraced and, and, and mainly, certainly in when you get away from metropolitan coastal America, still very attached to the idea of family life. So that's a factor in this. But I think I would mention a couple of other factors. One is, it goes back to um, something that sort of developed as a bit of technology, and that was just screening in early pregnancy. So the, with ultrasound, the ability to show a baby in the womb has, I think, contributed to the realization that you're dealing with a human being in there. It's not just a blob of cells or a lump of stuff and so on, that you're seeing a human being in its various stages of development. And so, you know, when mothers or other members of the family, you can see this, there's the sense of a living human being growing there. And so that the, the, and a recognition, or you might say a visual recognition of the fact that to have an abortion is to destroy a human life, that it's not something that's out of sight, it's now become visible. And along with that, another aspect of technology is the capacity um, uh, to um, do caesarean sections at early stages um, and remove a, a baby who otherwise would be threatened. So premature births, whether uh, through well, the natural vaginal passageway or through a caesarean, um, the fact is that there are uh, babies in intensive care units, uh, premature babies, who are being kept alive in the same hospitals that are killing babies that are older than them. So that's another aspect of this and so on. But then the third thing I would say is a political development in the United States, which is the idea that federal government is, which is part of the old constitution. They've got the constitutional idea, by the way, in the United States is that se federal government, and this is relevant to how you think of things in Australia, federal government is a secondary legislative level, funnily enough. You do, it isn't the, the, the primary one are individual states. Um, so federal government came into existence and federal legislation was meant to address matters that... Um, couldn't be resolved with individual states, such as sort of interstate trade and things of that sort. But what's ha what happened in the course of the 20th century, largely because of the Second World War, was the growth of federal government. Yes. And so people started to see federal government as the government, and then state government as something secondary, which was a reversal of the constitutional uh, uh, settlement that had been introduced in the 18th century. But there has been a rediscovery in recent times, or a a, a revival of the, the idea that the primary legislative body should be the individual state, not the federal government. The federal government is a secondary, residual source of legislation. Now, once you have that idea, what you're going to then think is that issues like abortion, but not only abortion, many other issues, should be matters for individual states to decide, not matters for federal government to resolve. And Roe versus Wade which is the relevant bit of legislation uh, at the federal, uh, uh, sorry, sorry the, court the, decision. The, the relevant bit of judicial decision judicial by the decision Supreme Court, um, decided that um, the, a woman's, there was a woman, a right of a woman to have an abortion on grounds of a constitutional provision, something in the Constitution, and that was the right to privacy. Now, I, I was going to say most legal scholars in this division on this, but let's just say there's a, there's a very significant legal opinion, even among people who are advocates of abortion, that Roe versus Wade was a bad piece of judicial decision, that it's not plausible, just as a piece of jurisprudence of legal reasoning, to think that there can be a right to abortion on the basis of a right to privacy. So what I think is happening is this, is that people are re-questioning Roe versus Wade at a time when there's been a revival of the idea that it's for states to legislate on fundamental questions concerning um, uh, people's lives. And that is an application of a principle. I mean, I don't mean that people intend it as such, but it's connected with the 
principle in Catholic social teaching of subsidiarity, that the idea that government should be as close to the people that it governs as possible. And so these sort of matters should be decided as close to the people that they affect. And the closest form of government that could decide this matter are individual states. So I think what, what might happen, I mean, I don't know what the outcome of this might be when the Supreme Court decides the matter, but the removal of Roe versus Wade, the, per, the point of that would not be to uh, legitimize anti-abortion legislation. It would be to say that it's up to individual states how they legislate on the question of abortion. So it's not, as it were, it's, not, it's neither meant to be liberal nor restrictive. It would be for individual states just to say that it's for states to decide what abortion laws they should have. And it's for their electorate to play their role in supporting or not supporting more or less um, restrictive legislation. So I think several things are coming together. Technology, uh, showing people babies living and growing within the womb, um, uh, the ability to preserve the lives of premature uh, babies. I think it's the American ide idealization of things like family life and so on. And then it's this recovery of the idea that the primary legislative body should be the individual state rather than the federal government and so on. So rather, as we began our conversation, it's a convergence of independent factors that have produced a kind of growing consciousness that has settled on this issue, as it happens, of abortion. Now, how that will be resolved, you know, who knows, it remains to be seen. But I do think it's very significant that this has all come to the fore now, because I think it's a set of considerations or forces that have been convergent on this. And the effect of where, whatever way this goes is going to be impactful, not just in the United States, but I think more broadly. Uh, and so I think we are in a very interesting period in which, on the one hand, going back to the early part of our conversation, there's an effort to recover genuine liberalism, genuine freedom. And there's also a, an effort to recover a sense of politics that removes, that, that, that relocates politics at the more local level, rather than having it at the level of the, the overarching and all-powerful state.